Welcome class to chapter 12, Specimen Handling, Transportation and Processing. In this chapter, we will learn how to handle our specimens after we have collected the sample, how to properly transport it into the lab, and how to process our blood sample once we return back to the lab. The thing we have to remember whenever we're doing phlebotomy for a especially for a hospital or doctor's office or if we're doing outpatient the main focus we have to always remember is what we call laboratory cycle is we have the pre-examination or pre-analytical phase we have the examination analytic phase and then we have the um, post examination or post analytical stages those are the stages we have as far as laboratory cycle that we always have to be mindful of when we're collecting a blood sample we have these cycles in place for two reasons first of all we have to always be mindful of our samples meaning we have to make sure they are adequate that they are in for, uh, that you in Invert them properly the amount of times that they needed to be inverted for the specimen and the additive to mix together. We also have to get it down to the lab in a timely manner, which is called our turnaround time. And we also have to make sure we follow the rules of centrifugation. If it is a SST tube, we have to make sure that it clots at least for 15 minutes before we can centrifuge it. And when it's a plasma tube, we have to make sure that we centrifuge it as soon as we get it down to the lab. The same thing with our lavender tops. Our lavender tops, we have to make sure that it hadn't coagulated, that we collected an adequate sample. Because if there are blood clots in a lavender top, then we have a hemolyzed tube and they cannot do a proper cell count because of the blood clotting. So these are things we have to be mindful of before we even step foot into the lab itself. Once we get into the lab, make sure we centrifuge it properly make sure all tubes are in their proper place where they need to go we need to make sure that hematology tubes go in hematology making sure that if we had a stat lab, stat lab that we tell the med techs that hey we got a stat lab in the centrifuge so they'll know that hey there's a stat lab in there as soon as they hear the ding saying that the centrifuge is finished spinning that they go grab that stat lab test so they can turn around and give those results to the doctor as soon as they result out so those are things we have to always be mindful of in a laboratory even us as a phlebotomist because different facilities run different ways so those are just the main focus points of when we're a phlebotomist now I talked about earlier TAT time or turnaround time. Turnaround time plays a significant role in the fact that blood can only stay within a tube or outside its source without being spun within a certain time frame before the cells start to break down and therefore it will give us when we do go to centrifuge it and they do go to medtex do go to run the laboratory test that is required from that specific tube it might come out with an erroneous result so turnaround time is very important usually especially if we're working outpatient and I know from experience working on the road and going to outpatient, I had only an hour to finish my labs and get it to the laboratory within an hour's time. Anything longer than that, I had to call a courier's office to come pick up my samples so they can get them to the lab in time. So I wouldn't have anything hemolyzed or I wouldn't have anything um, come back and the blood cells start to break down and it would come out with erroneous results therefore having me to recollect the sample because it was out too long the turnaround time was just too long in standing so tat time is very important hence why you always put your date your initials and the time that you draw it so you know okay i drew the labs at 10 30 i got till 11 30 12 o'clock to get to the lab to drop off my sample so we try not to stay any longer than that 
Now, as we know, with our pre-examination phase, it's broke up into different variables. Our pre-analytical phase, however you want to say it, they both mean the same. It's broken down into groups of patient variables, transportation and tube handling variables, specimen processing and storage variables, and specimen variables. The first one we're going to talk about is patient variables. Patient variable is like the first and foremost, most important thing that we have to comprehend as phlebotomists due to the fact this is our identification process. This is where we analyze our patient to see what exactly is going on with this patient. Where can we stick? Is he conscious? Is he in a coma? Is he gonna refuse? Is he fasting, non-fasting? What's their age? What's their gender? If they're pregnant, non-pregnant, what types of medication they're on, all this is how we comprehend into face patient variables. We have to make sure that we get any of those information. Now, as you know, if a patient refuses a lab, we are supposed to document that the patient had refused for labs and get the nurse to sign off on it. Also, we just can't say um, patient refused. No, 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 no. Because we have to at least let the nurse try to convince the patient to let us draw. And if you do need a nurse's assistance in order for you to get cooperation from the patient, make sure you go with the nurse also, because sometimes the nurse can say, okay, the patient wants you to draw, and then you go in there and the patient refuses again because they just don't want to get stuck. So if the nurse is there and the nurse can get, uh, okay, or he's allowing you to draw, if you're in there with her, she's a witness as to say, okay, he did, you are a witness as to say that yes, the nurse did get permission from the patient to do his labs. So that's a very important aspect also. As far as transportation and tube handling, always remember to fill your specimens at the minimum line. Usually we try to fill it at its correct line but there are variables to that situation too. It also depends on if the patient has good veins, bad veins, poor veins, teeny tiny itty bitty veins to where you don't get a blood draw uh, patient, especially our geriatric patients. Sometimes they can have very difficult veins. They can be small, fragile, and they, don't have a very good blood flow due to whatever circumstance they are in, hence, hence patient variable, goes back to patient variable. So if the patient is bedridden, never gets up other than to be sit up every once in a while by a CNA coming to sit them up, they really don't get any circulation or really don't get any movement within their body, therefore their blood circulation is very poor. So when we go to draw, it can kind of make it a little slow to where we won't be able to get a full maximum amount of blood into each tube. So we must remember to always get the minimum amount. And remember last time I showed you the minimum amount is marked by an hourglass on the side of the tube. If you can fill it up to that hourglass line, then you have a good adequacy uh, equation between the additive and blood for you to invert it and to mix properly. We also have to make sure that our tubes aren't leaking, that we don't break them because some of our tubes are glass tubes. We have to make sure that we gently invert and not shake like a martini. We're not doing martinis, we're doing blood samples. So we have to be mindful of those things also. We have to make sure when we're transporting Labs also is that they're sitting up and not laying on their side. Um, because if it's a SST tube or a clotic tube, it's going to clot sideways. So when you go to centrifuge it, it's not going to, the sample isn't going to come out right because, <clears throat> excuse me, the sample was laying on its side, so therefore that's how it clotted, and it's kind of hard to get it to go straight back up when it's clotted on the side of the tube, and you go to centrifuge it, and it's not going to separate properly. <coughs> Sorry. 
once we make it back to the lab and we have transported it correctly and it's back in the lab there's no breakage there's no leakage tubes were sitting up properly tubes were done adequately once we get into the lab we have to make sure that um we have to make sure once we get it into the lab that or should I say before we get it into the lab another thing we have to be mindful of <clears throat> during transportation and I forgot to add this but now I'm adding it during transportation we have to make sure depending on the test that we're drawing that we transport it properly if it's a bilirubin you already know that it has to be protected from light if it's at ammonia level we know we have to place it on ice you know we have to make sure and that the tube is sitting up on both times so those are other things as far as transporting and handling tubes in the transport variation section specimen process and storage variables simply put before we centrifuge we have to make sure that if it's a sst tube that is properly clotted if it's a plasma tube we know we put it in the centrifuge right away if we have a protect from light or or we have to keep it warm or something like that we have to make sure that we disclose all this to our med techs so they don't do anything to alter those tests if it's protect from light once we put it in the centrifuge as you know we can't keep it in the fall paper but we have to tell the text hey this is a Billy Rubin make sure that you know you put it back in the fall to protect it from light once it finishes the centrifuge the process or it's an ammonia level if you're not going to run it right away make sure you put it back on ice because it's an ammonia level um, we have to be mindful of contamination try not to cross contaminate your blood sample <clears throat> Or to contaminate your blood sample so if you're going into an infectious precaution room you know your samples stay outside the door you don't well you're not supposed to bring your tray in the door anyway but be very mindful not to accidentally have other samples anywhere near that area when we're doing uh, specimen verification we have to make sure that our tubes are adequate and appropriate that there's no hemolyzation going on that the blood volume equals that of the additive and that we're mixing it appropriately especially our anticoagulants and our clotting tubes and our plasma tubes and our our lavender top tubes we have to make sure that they invert it the proper way because we don't want to have to go back and recollect on a spec on a patient just because we didn't collect it properly the first time there's nothing that makes a patient even more mad is you walking back in their room and saying oh I need to recollect unless it's for a specific reason earlier I had said that sometimes when we do CBC counts there's patients who have fast reacting red blood cells where they split off and break off at a fast rate and then sometimes we have to do a CBC in a light blue top in order to slow it down. Sometimes that does happen. They don't know that they have this certain type of antibody. So sometimes when we go to collect a CBC tube, we have to turn around and collect another one along with a blue top so they can do an accurate cell, uh, blood cell count. And that's something that's not our fault and it's not really the patient's fault it's just something they might have not knew they had so that'll be the only exception to, as to uh, that will be the only good exception as to why you would have to recollect on a patient other than that it's not a good solution because you didn't adequately draw blood in the first place correctly gently gently mix your sample make sure that your blood is either at the minimum line or filled up to the appropriate spot that you're not overfilling it 
if it doesn't need to be clotted, make sure you, it isn't clotting, especially your lavender top tubes. You don't want a clot in there. If you have a clot in that lavender tube, you might as well just go ahead and recollect that purple top because it's not a good sample at all. And that's easy to do, especially if you have a vein that is slow and it's sluggish and it's just and if you're using a butterfly at that moment you got to remember that blood has to travel all the way through a tube tubing system before it gets into the blood sample tube <coughs> sorry all right labeling the specimen correctly Labeling is the most important thing we have to do. We have to make sure that the proper labels on the proper sample. Hence, why when we're labeling our blood sample, first and foremost, we're doing it in front of the patient, and we are re-verifying that this tube of blood goes to this person's label. So as we're labeling that tube sample, we're re asking the patient, is this your correct first and last name? Is this your correct birthday? Of course, we can tell if it's male or female. And then we also have to make sure that we initial it with our initials, the date and time that we collected it, and that the label is placed on the tube in the correct way also. If the tube is mislabeled, and I don't mean as far as patient discrepancy. I mean as far as placing the label on the tube itself. Sometimes that can cause the machine to misread the barcode. Therefore, it may invertly put that patient's test result in another patient's file because it read the barcode the wrong way if we don't properly put the tube label on the tube the correct way. If you look at figure 12-2, it shows you the proper way of how a tube should be labeled. We usually start from the bottom and work our way up to the top so the barcode is on the front of the tube itself. If you look at figure 12-3, it shows you the phlebotomist is labeling the tube sample. And she's also re-verifying with the patient itself saying, this is your tube, this is your name, and this is your information. And she's also putting her initials, the time and date that she collected this sample. Also, once we have collected our specimen, our next thing, and after we have labeled it and double checked to verify that is the correct patient's tube of blood, we're going to place the specimen in a leak proof plastic biohazard bag. This is how we transport our samples back into the lab. That way, it protects it from getting any contaminants or any pathogens attached to the tube to cause it to not have a correct lab result based on any contaminants that might have occurred onto the tube. So this is to protect your samples from any pathogens or contaminations that may occur while you're transporting it back to the lab. We always place the sample inside the biohazard bag and our requisition or extra labels on the outside of the bag in a little pouch that is on the bag itself. This is to maintain, to make sure that your requisition or your extra labels don't get any contaminant on it. Especially if you're transporting a urine specimen, sometimes, especially if you're collecting it from a nurse who collected the sample herself, sometimes they might not seal the jar correctly and it might be leaking and it's leaking within the bag. So if our, spe our requisition or our labels are inside that bag, those, those articles get contaminated as well with the urine. So that's why it has a pouch for where you need to place your requisition or extra stickers at, which is outside of the bag itself. 
Whenever possible, always remember that tubes are supposed to be laying straight up and down and not on the side. This is to not only to help it to do what it needs to do, like such as an SST tube has to clot. Um, and we have to also make sure that our CBC tubes don't clot. So we try to put it in a upright position to minimize the cause of uh, hemolysis. Because we don't want our blood to hemolyze at all. And to always handle blood gently. Uh, we don't want to break up our red blood cells before we get down to the lab for the lab techs to do a proper blood cell count. So we don't want to be bouncing around, skipping around the hall with our samples in our hands. Um, we want to walk normally to the lab to drop off our specimens. Now, if you take a look at figure 12.4, it shows you the different types of uh, biohazard bags that are available. Uh, you see on this side are our regular biohazard bags, and they come with different color um, stripes. Uh, Vel not Velcro, Ziploc tops, different colors. And then we have our red stat bags of what we're supposed to place our stat labs in when we have stats. And then we have our ambient protect from light tube. It's an ambient color tube. And then a dark red tube. And that means stat also. Or you can put, like, there's different types of labels, which is what B is. It tells you to not throw the tube away to hold it. There's a stat label. There's an ER, it tells you it comes from the ER or ED now, uh, stat labels. They have saved the specimen. There's also specimens that say do not open top because if it's an iodized calcium tube, we, the text know better than to open up the specimen top due to the fact if they pop open the specimen top, it doesn't give a correct result for ionized calcium. The top has to be on. Another thing, we always have to make sure that we carry or bring back the specimen in a timely manner. There goes that TAT time. If for some other reason you might be running behind, especially if you're on the field and you're out off site, if you don't think you're going to make this make it back to the lab in a timely manner that you arrange for the courier to come pick up your labs for them in order to bring them to the lab within a specific amount of time if your specimens have to be handled in a particular special way make sure you do those type of things like protect from light place on ice keep warm all those things have to be accounted for in the factor so that you can have a correct result whenever the techs go to run those specific tests that require those specific handling needs. If you take a look at figure, or should I say table 12.1 in the textbook, it gives you all the different tests that need specific handling instructions for. Some hospitals, if you take a look at figure 12.5, some hospitals have these little fancy little doodads. Um, I know when I worked at Lourdes, I had these little blue containers where we, if we had a specimen that had to be placed on ice, we put our tubes in here and it would place it on ice. And then if we had the centrifuge, we would take it out, centrifuge it, and place the blue or a new blue container next to the centrifuge so the techs can have a, a ice tray to put the tube in until they can run it. Another thing these are, these are tube finished lab result tube carriers. Um, some hospitals have them, some don't. And of course you got the old standby biohazard bag and it looks like ice was in it. The tube is on the outside next to the ice pack that was placed in the ice. Or protects from like you see how they have foil around this particular tube they have foil on this tube right here and then you have the uh, place on ice where the tube is on the outside and the ice is on the inside or we have these little containers right here which is an ice pack fancy ice pack 
that you place the tube inside the ice pack and it keeps it cool. These are protect from light tube trays that you can carry if you don't have the fall paper. If you have these, these are protect from light. If not, you do it the old fashioned way with the fall paper around the tube. <clears throat> When we're handling specimens that go to microbiology, we have to make sure that we transport this as soon as possible to microbiology lab so they can do their preparation and get the culture in the media and to split it off and do what they need to do. Because sometimes culture, when we have micro collection cultures, they have to incubate in a special machine before they can run any specific test on it. So the faster we get it into the lab, the faster the test can run its incubation process in order for the patient to see why they have, say, for example, blood cultures. It takes 72 hours for a full report of a blood culture to run. In that meantime, you have a 24 hour preliminary report, then you have a 48 hour preliminary report, and then 72 hours you have the full report. And the reason why they break it down into so many factors is this patient is already suffering from a fever of unknown origin. The current antibiotics that they're taking is not really working, it's just controlling the fever of unknown origin. So once they find out what's causing the fever or why this patient is having a fever, they'll know the preliminary of it for 24 hours or now to where they can either adjust the antibiotics that they're currently on to kind of help a little bit more than what the current antibiotic is currently doing. And then 48 hours, they can make it a little bit stronger. And then by the time 72 hours comes around, they'll have the correct antibiotic for that patient to, in order for them to get rid of whatever infection or viral or bacterial that is attacking their system and giving them a, a fever, they'll be able to give an antibiotic uh, strong enough to get rid of that fever within 72 hours. So that's why it's very important to get your micro collection specimens to micro as soon as possible so they can run these reports, get these reports ready. The next important thing is always remember blood cultures, we have to have a zero contamination rate on those specimens, meaning you can't have any outside interference on those blood collection bottles. So when we're collecting blood collection blood culture bottles, we house we have to make sure that we clean the patient's site with a chlorhexaprep, which is the up and down motion for 15 to 20 minutes. And then once we let that dry, we have to prep our tops, meaning we have to wipe our tops off with alcohol. Make sure the alcohol dries on those tops before we pop them into the blood culture collection vacutainer holder. Because there's a specific vacutainer holder we put blood cultures in. And remember and foremost, your order of draw. If you have blood cultures, nine out of 10, you probably have a CBC and a CMP also to draw. So according to order draw, what goes first? Blood culture, because we want the impurities. So we'll draw blood cultures, then we would draw our SST, and then we would draw our lavender top, which in other words, we would draw our blood cultures, we would draw our CMP, and we would draw our CBC. <clears throat> When we're transporting to remote satellite labs, now some labs cannot be run in a hospital no matter how big it is. There are some labs that have to go to a remote area, hence Mayo Laboratory. Mayo Laboratory runs a lot of genetic test, extensive, let me rephrase that, extensive genetic testing. Mayo Lab runs those extensive heavy metal testing. Mail lab runs those. There are some tests that the hospital cannot run on its own because the equipment is not big enough. Labs are within a certain amount of space and a certain amount of text to where they can't have all the necessary equipment that they need to run any extensive laboratory work. There's also an extensive lipid panel that sometimes has to go out to Mayo. Same thing with an extensive 
PT INR tests that sometimes have to go to Mayo Lab. It's one of those next step tests that the hospital may not be equipped to run. So they would have to remote it out or ship it out to Mayo Lab. Now, when we're shipping out samples, we still follow the same procedure. We still have to be mindful of our TAT time. We also still have to be mindful of our proper transportation of the specimen into the lab. We have to make sure if it has to clot off, to clot off at a certain amount of time and that we centrifuge it, separate it, freeze it if we need to freeze it, which nine out of 10, most specimens, if it's a serum sample, we do have to freeze that sample and an allocated tube and then we have to pack it off when we once we pack it off we have to pack it off at least in three different containers so it doesn't spill it doesn't turn sideways it, that it stays in an upright position at all times and that is protected and that the specimen is protected from any elements be it rain sleet snow or hail or hot weather in the south um, and also if by God forbid if the driver gets in an accident or the plane happens because most of this goes ship out to by plane if the plane crashes guess what that sample is still protected because of how many times we packed it packed it down to, in order to ship it now this is one container in figure 12.6, this is a courier container, meaning this is if a courier comes to pick up your labs at a specific facility, they'll put it in a container like this that has a red biohazard bag, uh, symbol on the bag saying that this is biohazardous material in this bag. Do not consume or do not put food in it. It's not a cooler cooler, you know, like the coolers we put food in. No, it's a cooler but it's only made for biohazardous material. Of course, us as phlebotomists, we work in the lab, we hand deliver our specimens, go figure. At Lourdes and at Lafayette General, cause I've been to the lab, I think most hospitals now, each floor in a hospital has what they call a pneumatic tube system and basically if you have a stat lab and you are the phlebotomist in charge of that floor you can go ahead and draw your stat lab put it in a red stat bag and send it through the mnemonic tube system which is basically if you go to the bank and you go to the teller that's a mnemonic tube system the little bank tube as we call it uh, where you put it in a bank cartridge you go lab and it sends it straight in or some people will refer to it as the caterpillar i know when i used to work at lords i'll go from outpatient and if i walk into the main hospital from the connecting building um you can actually hear the tube system through the hall going to the lab because it ran into that hallway it was kind of funny to hear it going off because it sounds like um those train the trains in a tunnel because it's shooting through so fast <laughs> and then of course in always you have the transport or the courier service that can also transport your blood from one facility to another or some facilities draw their own labs and they'll call for a courier service to drop it off to the lab so you have hand mnemonic tube transportation our courier service the newest thing is drones <laughs> i never seen these i'm not sure exactly um i haven't seen these but i've heard the higher um the higher states the northern states use these the drone system it's pretty much works the same way as the pneumatic tube system but if you ever seen those drones and basically what it does it has a basket attached to it where you put your samples into it it flies it to the lab and flies back whatever else you need to have done and <clears throat> it'll bring it to the lab usually these are used if you're in a area where say 
you had an earthquake and the roads are all blocked due to a rock slide, such as California. Well, the hospital is still up and running, but it needs um, an extensive lab to be run. But you can't, a courier service can't bring it there. You can't fly it there. You can't, there's, because everything is shut down. So they would use the drones to go pick up that sample and teleport and transport it to the hospital of where it needed to go. So basically that's what a drone does. It, it picks up and delivers things that we cannot physically pick up and deliver due to unusual circumstances or natural circumstances or wartime circumstances. You definitely don't want to go pick up a lab sample and there's gun bullet shells flying everywhere. Uh, send in the drone, please. <laughs> Processing samples once it arrives into the lab. Yay! Everything we need to do once we get back to the lab before, because pre means before, before we can centrifuge it. So before we place it in the centrifuge, uh -huh, we have to make sure that if it's a serum separated tube, that it's fully clotted. <clears throat> that is fully clotted. And if it's a plasma one, we have to make sure that we centrifuge it the way it has to be. <coughs> so during the process of centrifusion is when it's doing its tang. It's separating the whole blood or the the other cells that are not needed and if it's a SST tube I'm separating the whole cells from my serum and I'm collecting my serum that is going to be separated by the polymer that's at the bottom of the tube before you spin it in the centrifuge so as you're spinning and the circum the circumference of the centrifuge is going around and around and around and spinning it Slowly, your polymer is popping up, your whole cell blood count is going down, and your serum is staying to the top. Now, when we're dealing with a plain red top, we have to be very mindful of after centrifusion due to the fact that there's no polymer to separate the two. Your serum will be at the top and your red cells that are floating to the bottom will be at the bottom. But if you're not careful with taking it out or if you're not careful in transporting it from the centrifuge to your workstation, you can actually, actually remix the two back together again if you're not careful, if you're not mindful of what you're doing. And of course, post centrifusion is after it's been centrifuged and you allocate it out and you do everything that needs to be done. If it's plasma, you're allocating it out. If it's, um, if it is a red top without the polymer, then we know that we have to separate the serum before it mixes back up and allocate it out into another tube and freeze that sample if it needs to be frozen to be shipped off. Any, all those things are done during post centrifusion after it's been centrifuged. According to CLSI, when we're handling samples, we have to make sure that we follow their guidelines and their procedures on handling and processing the labs properly. That certain labs do not need to be centrifuged, such as hematology labs. Why? Hematology is counting your red and white blood cells to make sure they're multiplying and dividing the proper way. We don't necessarily have to centrifuge coagulation tubes. We don't We have to make sure that we gently uh, invert our tubes to where the additive in the blood mixes appropriately. Those are things and those are guidelines and procedures and transportation guidelines we have to follow whenever we do a blood sample. When we go into <clears throat> pre-certification, as I said earlier, specimens must be handled and processed with care 
prior to and after specimens have been centrifuged and that they have to be separated according to what tests they're being tested for in accordance to what the guidelines are and the procedures are for that. And that we allow it to clot when we expose a clot. Now, centrifusion, as you know, we must centrifuge a specimen at least 30 to 60 minutes per centrifugation purposes. That's why usually we don't centrifuge um, unless it's a stat. We usually don't turn on the big heavy duty centrifuge until it's full. And then we turn it on because it takes so long. It takes anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes for it to even rotate. Usually we'll put it to spin if there's a stat and we already see specimens in there, then we'll put the stat in and turn it on so all of them can get spun down at the same time. But we usually, if there's no stats in the rotation, then we wait till at least it's full, but we just make sure that it is within a scope to where it won't hemolyze also. Um, if we always leave the caps on, that's a gimme. Um, you know how you know when your centrifuge, your centrifuge isn't working? When you start hearing clang, 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 because all your tops done popped off because the pressure is so high in your centrifuge that it popped all your sample tops. All of them. So now you got a bigger mess to carry and a bigger mess to clean up. So... That's how you know when your centrifuge needs to be recalibrated. When you start hearing clang, 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 and all your tops off your blood, blood sample tubes are at the bottom of the centrifuge. Not a pretty sight. <laughs> so never ever open a top in a centrifuge because we want the top on. When tops stop popping, that's when we know something's wrong with the machine. So if you look at figure 12.8, these are different types of centrifuge. These are on the small scale. Usually we'll put our stats in the smaller one and our routines in the bigger one, being that we usually wait till it's full before we do it. So during post centrifusion, as you remember, post centrifusion, this is um, after it's been centrifuged. This is when we have to separate our serum and our plasma, refrigerate if we need to. This is where we divide or allocate between the. Remember, I said one tube, one tube of blood can usually run different a certain amount of tests off of it. That way, you don't have to draw so many tubes on the patient and cause the patient to go in anemia due to all the tubes. So basically one tube can at least run three to four different tests on it. As long as there's no special instructions on how to transport that tube. So if it's an iodized calcium, of course, we're going to have to draw another tube because why we can't pop the top off of the tube after it's been, um, after it's been spun. So those are certain criteria we have to be mindful for. And you learn, you'll learn what, <clears throat> you pretty much learn what test can go in one tube and share a tube with another test as you go along and work in the lab. So it's something that is learned through your training. It's not something, um, yeah, you'll know as you go along in your training. Also, if anything needs to be frozen as far as your serum or your plasma, you'll do it at that time. You have to make sure that any serum or plasma doesn't come into contact with any of the polymer. So meaning you're just skimming, you're just skimming at the top. So once you reach the bottom and you're a little too close to that polymer barrier or that gel barrier, you stop. These are, if you look at figure 1210, these show you different rams of 
centrifugation and I'll load that up. So as you can see, this one had a polymer. You see how the the plasma is at the top because that's a mint green. The plasma is at the top and then your polymer and then your cells, blood cell, the whole blood cells that are at the bottom. This in figure B is an example of a hemolyzed specimen, believe it or not. Um, it did separate, but as you, as you can see, it's got that pink tinge to it. Usually that's a sign of hemolyzation, meaning either it wasn't transported back to the lab in time or the patient had a very slow draw to where the red blood cells started to break down before they even started to get into the, before it went through the centrifugation phase. And of course, on C, that is your um, uh, anticoagulation tube, your light blue tube, which we do spin down to separate our sample. And then if you're not careful, being that there's no polymer, and D, it shows you it mixed back up. So that's what we mean when we say you have to be very mindful and very careful whenever you don't have a separator or a polymer within your tube because it'll be very easy to shake it up and and not intentionally, just a little gyration and then all of a sudden you got it and um, it mixes back together. Okay. Nope. Nope. Okay. Uh, making sure you use the right centrifuge, which is very, very, very important. Because in a big industrial hospital size centrifuge, each one of those compartments, like if you have a light blue top, and every once in a while we have to spin. A purple top down because we're we have a B N P. That is the only time. That is the only test where a purple top will actually go to chemistry and get spun down. Tubes like that go in a. It's still a big industrial size centrifuge, but the containers that hold the tubes are a shorter capacity to where those tubes don't get lost in the tube that holds the centrifuge that are in placed in the centrifuge i'm sorry so we have to make sure that we are putting the right tube in the correct centrifuge container we have to be mindful of our spin and rotation time because if it spins too fast, next thing you're going to hear is tops popping off because the force, the negative G force, which is if you ever rode, ever been to a carnival and you rode Gravitron, that is negative G force. That's what makes you, and as you know, if you rode Gravitron, the faster it goes, the more your face is planted to the, against the wall and you, you smile and then all of a sudden your cheeks feel like they're falling backwards same thing with a centrifuge if the centrifuge is spinning too too fast um the gravity or the negative g-force will force it to pop those tubes and that's not what we want to do because then once the tubes are all popped then the blood starts splattering everywhere and not a good idea not a good idea so me mindful of your speed time, making sure you put your tubes in the correct centrifuge and make sure that you set it at the correct time that it needs to be done and that your centrifuge has been calibrated or tested every, I, I believe we do it every year, every every three to six months or a year being depending on the capacity of the lab. If it's a bigger lab, they'll do it every six months. It, three to six months and if it's a small lab that doesn't really do anything they probably wait till the year all right so when we're shipping specimens for specialty labs 
that is outside the scope of the normal lab, we have to not only follow CLSI guidelines as far as transportation, proper transportation, making sure we collect it in the right tube, make sure it's preserved in the correct way. We also have to be mindful of the Department of Transportation, the DOT. We also have to follow the WHO and the UN Committee of Experts, and of course, our world famous CDC. We definitely don't want to be transporting anything that can be contagious. Or let me rephrase that we don't want to transport anything contagious the wrong way. Ha ha. So that's that. We don't want to, we, so we have to follow these guidelines as far as transporting any dangerous biohazardous waste material. We have to follow these guidelines. We have to make sure that we follow, making sure that if it's a pathogen, you know, bacterial, viral, pesticide, any of those things that we properly package those materials because if they happen to be an infectious substance, we definitely don't want that to get out into the public because then everybody will get sick. So we have to make sure we package them the appropriate way. Now, there are two cate uh, categories that classify infectious substance. You have category A and category B. Category A is just dig yourself six feet under and put yourself in a casket. It's a life-threatening Ebola. Uh, now we fighting with COVID. You can't, it's a possibility of being a life-threatening disease. And then you have category B, which it usually isn't life-threatening, but it can disable you. Such as, hmm. The one. What disease, what infectious disease can disable you? Oh, um, we had the N1, can't put my finger on it at the moment, but there is, these are diseases that can kind of, they're not going to, they're not going to hurt, they're not going to kill you. Or expire you sorry you're not going to expire from them but you may be permanently disabled due to them such as asbestos asbestos is not really life-threatening it can be life-threatening but it's more or less a permanent disability due to the lung it affects your lungs right so when we're shipping as you know, if you work in transport, as we call it, or processing, it just depends on how hospitals have it classified. I know we had, we called it transporting, no, we called it processing in Lourdes. And these were the ladies who actually packaged the blood. Um, they spun their, they had their own little centrifuge where they would spin whatever tubes needed to be spun. They were separated, allocated out, freeze it if it needed to be frozen. Uh, protected from light if it needed to be protected from light. They will mark it, categorize it, document it, ship it out, pack it, and send it off to the appropriate lab where it needed to be. That was their responsibility. And they were also called to confirm a time and date when the specimen would be sent out and what time it would be ready to go and what time that person was coming to pick it up to make it to the airplane. They also made sure that all, all labels or all samples were properly labeled with the patient's name, the patient's ID, birth, uh, its gender, birthday, first and last name, special ID number that it was, they put there, that the physician who ordered the test was on there, that they put the time and date that it was collected, what type of source it was, meaning is it serum, is it plasma, is it a culture, is it um, a swab, a scraping, what is it? That was their job to mark those specimens and getting them ready to be shipped out. When we are, or when a doctor's office calls, 
there are different ways we can send out reports or laboratory reports once the test has been finished running. There's the written report, the verbal report that can be sent out. Most of the time, the written report, as soon as the report, is, as soon as the med tech signs off on it, now that we have most doctors are linked into the lab, that lab report automatically gets sent to the doctor's computer system to where he can pull up the lab results. That we would consider a written report. Another way is we can print off the report from the patient's file and hand it physically to the doctor. That's still considered a written report, even though it's printed out. <coughs> Another good thing about these written orders is basically um, the doctor who has ordered anything They can get, say they ordered more than one test. Well, these te these reports will have all a list of all tests that they ran on this particular patient. It won't be just the one test. It'll be everything and it'll tell them if it's within normal, abnormal, or if it's in critical value. Now, if it's in critical value, the med tech has already informed the doctor of that critical value happening they just want the report in they also just want the report to verify also <coughs> and it stays in the um, patient's file verbal reports aren't are few and far between now now that the lab and the doctor's offices can communicate a little better due to programming that we have available now so if a stat lab comes across or critical values come across that'll be the only time that they'll get a, a verbal report or a verbal call um, versus it waiting for the med tech to sign off on it and then it'll immediately go into the uh, doctor's computer system so Nowadays, it's not that many times you do a verbal report on a patient's uh, lab results. Most of the time, it's computer access <clears throat> as soon as it results out. <coughs> Sorry. Um, when we're doing a verbal report, we have to make sure we obtain all information needed in order to pull up these reports because we don't want to mistakenly pull up the wrong patient's report. Especially in South Louisiana, we have so many uh, people with the same exact name, especially our older generation, our Jerry's, because the back in the day they used to always believe you know you had your name and then you had your saint name and then you have your last name where there are so many Thibodeaux, Boudreaux, Hebert's, Broussards, Robichaux's that you might have John James Robichaux and then you have another John James Robichaux and it's just that they might have different birthdays so we have to be very mindful and very careful with giving a doctor a verbal report that we pull up the correct patient's name so therefore we must acquire the correct information in order to pull that patient's name in order to give the doctor the verbal report of their lab samples. And usually we have a form like this, um, the same as figure 1214 to where we can document everything that we need to document in order to give it to the doctor in a verbal order. As you know, computer system is now the thing. Everything is transmitted via computer uh, there's almost an obsolete of a verbal report because as soon as the med tech signs off that report is transmitted to the doctor's computer for him to pull it up at any time that he needs it unless like i said there's a critical value or it's stat labs and they need those results before the med tech can sign off on it so those are the only exceptions as for that and of course you can print the results out also and give them to the doctor as well which sometimes we do both we get um it goes to their 
computer system and then we also send them via mail the hard copy so they can actually put them in their patient file well this concludes chapter 12 lecture if you have any questions please feel free to text or call me at any time well between 8 and 6 Monday through Friday and I'll be more than happy to answer any question thank you and have a nice day bye-bye